That's better. I've got to plug the camera in. <laughs> I've got to sort the flickering thing out. Hold on. I've got to change those. Should have done these things before I started. Which is cameras with default to 50 hertz refresh rate instead of 60 hertz. Be a bit easier when we'll I have to change it every time. Right, changed. So, here we go. Should be good now. So, how is everyone? I saw you getting yourself some food there, Fred. So, hey, Fred, Dave. Peter. So yeah, I think I'm good to go. I'm not sure what we're gonna to do today. You got a pink soldering iron. Okay. I can't say I've ever seen a pink soldering iron. I think I have. Yeah, he quizzes you. No, I'm trying to reorganise things. Yeah. I should have prepared better. This is always the case. Yeah, Chris, I know she dropped off the map a little bit for a while there. For a couple of months, she just vanished. I guess she was busy with stuff. Yeah, I'm not quite sure what I'm going to do today, like I said. Um, I don't have anything in particular. I've got an idea, something we could look at. Um, oh, you mean... No, right, okay, now I've got you what you mean, Peter. Okay, yes. The, um, the icon after the... Your name, obviously being membership thing. Um, so as you're a member, the longer you've been a member, the higher it ranks you. So it's got graduations. So you've obviously gone to the next level because you've been a member for so long. You're a bit sick, eh? Okay. Was it the COVID thing? Is it something else? Good to hear you're getting better though. Hey Johnny. Yeah, so um much my thing here. It should be all up there. Here we go. Yeah. So what I've got here, I've got some bits and pieces which arrived in my bag um, a couple of days ago, I suppose. So I did them anyway, recorded them. And um, one year was it? Okay, yeah, I can't remember what. Uh, because I set all this up ages ago when I first set up the membership thing, and I couldn't remember what the graduations were for the actual icons that allocates. Because I created those icons, obviously. And, um, but that was a while ago. Um, you know, yeah, so I've got some stuff which I've put in the mailbag, and you might tinker with them a little bit. I don't know, just some assembly stuff. They look quite good, but it might interest some of you. Um, Pretty basic things, but might be interesting for you. You see them in mailbag anyway, but I didn't show them fully in mailbag, so I probably will come a bit better in this. Um, I've also got a bit of a headache today. Hey, Willem, how's it going? Andre? Greg? got banned really for that okay 
Hmm. Interesting. I don't think that's really bannable unless someone's trying to be careful about potentially getting sued. Maybe, I don't know. But then you just remove the comment. Oh. I don't know. There was someone... I, I mean, I blocked someone on... I think I put my time out, actually. I think I put my time out on someone else's... Was it Clive's? I think it might have been. I think it was one of Clive's streams a couple of weeks ago. I actually put someone in time out, I think it was, for posting something which could have been defamatory. So I stripped that off. But, you know, you have to be a little bit careful. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. But banning? Mm. Yeah. Don't know. Anyway, so... Um, Yes, yeah, so I've got a bit of a headache today, so I'm not completely with it. Not particularly myself. So, I've also got a PlayStation... Well, it's not really a play, PlayStation 1, it's an original PlayStation. Um, which apparently has a fault. You might have a look at that. I've had it sitting around for ages. Hey, Mark, how's it going? Thank you very much for becoming a member. I think I've also now set up a thing so that when someone becomes a member, I believe it now tweets on my Twitter page as well. I haven't had an occurrence yet, so maybe this will be the first one which shows up. We'll see. So, um, so Mark, what, what you'll find is when you go to my channel there is a playlist on the channel on the main page somewhere somewhere it'll be there anyway um, memberships early access so and I'll do videos for people which put me on YouTube rather than on Patreon you at least still get to see the videos ahead of time so I publish early and I preview them to supporters so as a supporter you would get access to them a bit earlier and just look for that playlist and um, that's where you'll see them come up. Only members can see that. So that way Patreon see it and members will see it at the same time. So that's the best way I could do it. Anytime mic wiring. What do you mean anytime mic wiring? I get negative temperatures at night now, Greg. Yeah, we're just coming into summer now. I actually, I'm actually the reason I've got headaches because I got sunburnt yesterday a little bit, and I've I don't do well being in the sun. Although it wasn't actually sunny, it was overcast all day, but I still got burnt anyway. Um, any tone, all right. Any tone, mic wiring. Let me see. I don't know of anything specific, but I'm just looking now. Um, I do have a radio circuit over here, which might show the mic wiring on it. This doesn't seem to be the right one. I don't see it. I might have something here, I'll have to have a look for you. Um, yes, yeah, so I've been outside for the past couple of days. Is that it? No, that's not it. Um, building a deck, 
and I got a bit sunburned, that's why I got a headache. I don't do well with being outside of an indoors person. Um, it's got some connections markings on, a, on, hit, on the circuit diagram for the, the functions, but nothing actually. Not on this one, anyway, not this diagram. Let's keep going. Oh, well. It's multiple pages, but I can't find it. Right, here we go. I'll show you this. This may or may not be correct. This is for a Anytone AT5555. Um, uh, this one here. Here we go. So it is up here. There is the clamp pin out. So it's one of those RJ45 clamps, isn't it? Um, I'm guessing that's the mic connector. Seems it's got a microphone and a PTT on there. I'm guessing it is. Might not be that. Um, do I have anything else on this diagram here? A light hat bulb. But I don't know if it's even the right one. It might be completely different to what you've got. Just trying to see if there's anything else on that board I can see. See, I'm not seeing it. Yeah. Anyway, that's what I've got. So maybe that addresses what you need. Yeah, it's like a telephone plug. Yeah, that's right. RJ45 thing. Is it, was it RJ11? Is it maybe it's RJ11? I can't remember. I can't remember they are. RJ18? Something like that. Yeah, those plugs are not suited to microphones because they're not meant for being pulled on. It's ridiculous. It's really bad design. I don't know why they use them. Climate change? Well, not really. Um, probably not. Not really. Maybe it's for RJ45 then, yeah. I can't put the bloody here. So the AT triple five N is what you've got, is it? Let's see if we've got anything else. Hold on. Um, be with me. Not in there. I have a few different places where I keep stuff. So, so depending on what it is. No, that's all I've got in the tones. Well, you know, night and day, you know, sometimes it gets dark, sometimes it gets light. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Hey, Brian, sorry, I missed you. Hello there. How's it going? It's the 5555. So that's that diagram I showed you then. It will be the right diagram for your radio. Which membership gives me the better cut? Memberships or Patreon? Uh, Patreon. Patreon. Uh, YouTube has a 30% fee. Um, but to be honest, I'm just grateful to get anything, so I don't really mind. <laughs> you know, if I get, you know, 66% or whatever it is of YouTube, it's still better than not. So. But Patreon's one which gives me the best um, performance, I suppose. Um, yeah, just 
It's also the ones that seems to perform better, but either one, you know, if you want if you want to use the YouTube one, that's fine, it's up to you. If you, if you want to support me, that's great. I appreciate it. Um Okay. Yeah, I've worked on one of those any times a while ago. I've worked on one here. I've only ever seen one. Alright, um, back to this. Yeah, so like I said, I'm not feeling 100% today. Of course, I've got this bloody headache from being outside. I've been building a deck, right? So, we had a. I built, had a garage built uh, five years ago, four or five years ago now. And um, I've got a doorway into the house, which is a distance away from the doorway in the garage, right? And um, my wife wanted me to build a deck for a long time to get between the doorway from the house to the doorway in the garage, so we got like a walkway. And um, so that's what I've been doing the past two days. And I feel a bit bad because I'm not don't, I don't do it outside. <laughs> what didn't help as well is that because I've been at work for two months, my fitness is what well, fitness it was. <laughs> for the floor so I've got these aching muscles today my legs and everything anyway hey Ian out with the wife eh if you're shopping you should have plenty of time oh it's a bad stereotype isn't it no worries Ian I'll catch you later on hopefully you can get here without too long too much delay You flex all your D's in. Oh, there's those um, little yellow strips, like six inch strips, or whatever they were. Those ones, those ones you mean. Using a hammer, Greg. Old fashioned way, I don't have much in the way of flashy tools like that. Um, hey, Andy. Um, Dustin, how's it going? You'll do stream from time to time, Dustin. Just. Um, it's a bit sporadic. I don't necessarily have a, like a set schedule. I'll just do it when I feel like it, pretty much. Um, yeah, so yeah, it's all old-fashioned old, old way. So I had to attach a uh, strip of wood to the garage wall to hold up one side of the deck, and it's all on the ground, and obviously it doesn't float in the air. But to level all that out and Nail it all together and use metal strapping and all sorts of stuff. So I finally finished it yesterday, about probably, I don't know, it must have been about 4 o'clock last night or something like that. I started on it at upper 7 in the morning. Oh, I'm glad you like the videos. For me all to see a band, any brandy points, oh good on you. <laughs> hey, you know, whilst you can get out and you might as well. It's better than you know lockdown stuff, eh? You can't go anywhere and do anything. You don't normally see it live, yeah. Not you catch up with the playback, do you though, Dustin? <clears throat> I've had some I actually had a codeine for the headache. I've got codeine for migraine, so I had one of them try and head it off before it becomes worse. So, yes. We'll see, here we go. Happy to now be a Patreon. If you just joined John, let's open my email up. Oh look, you have. Thank you very much. Welcome to the team. Excellent. 
you know, if you look at the Patreon stuff, you'll see that what I do a lot of the times you'll see a pre-release video there. So I might release them maybe even a week ahead of time. I, I tend to release them ahead of time as much as I can. Um, I don't sort of um, edit the videos and then release them straight away to the public. I just make them hang on a bit and um, give the supporters a chance to see them first. Um, you know, it's one of the few perks I offer. So. <laughs> So uh, I'm just grateful for the support because it helps with the pay for the channel, helps me buy stuff from my bag and that sort of stuff. As I say, lots of times in the actual videos. So, um, doing good. Hey, David. For, for refrigeration, how's it going? Thank you very much. Yeah. So we'll think with something soon. Um, I've got some jumper things. This might actually interest Ian as well. So. I might wait until Ian comes back. Oh, I don't know, it's quite a while actually. Ian might be out for a while. <laughs> um, yeah, some four-way jumping blocks for doing four-way short on a multimeter. And I picked up some from eBay and I ordered two different sizes and the guy sent me some extra ones as well. He actually said, I like me, he recognized me from the video stuff, you know, YouTube, and he said, oh, I like your stuff, so I'm going to send you some extra ones. So, um, so, uh, thanks Mark, and so I've got three different types of these jumpers, which is great, because what I've got is one that does a standard 19mm banana jack, four-way spacing. I should just shade them, shouldn't I? I'm describing them. I also got one for the Datrons multimeters, because they've got weird spacings, and also for the HP multimeter as well, which is also a slightly weird spacing. So, um, but they're like a kit form, you have to assemble them in the format you want, because one is just like a standard four pin, which is fine, and the other ones are adjustable, you can choose where you put the banana jacks, or the banana plugs, so you can change spaces just to your, what suits you. And you talk about inrush stuff again, Dave. I did a video on that, wasn't that enough? I'm, I'm not an expert. <laughs> Uh, sorry, I'm a bit stiff. Get the muscles working. Uh, um, so, what, what did you actually have in mind, Dave, about inrush? What did you want to know? In case I can answer it. You know, kind of generalized, theoretical, limited knowledge way. Um, yeah. What else we got? So I've got this. I, did, I think I'll start talking about this, and I've got a PlayStation sitting here. I've got distracted by something, um, which apparently doesn't work properly. I might have a look at that and see if it can actually verify it doesn't work properly, and maybe fix it. I might do that. Record some video on it. But I've got my CCTV tester thing here, that IP5200, which I can plug into it to view the video output. More questions than answers. Hey David, how's it going? Thanks for the video, it's indication. Excellent, thank you much. So, I've said this many times in the past, but some of you wouldn't have heard it because you probably haven't been around the channel for that long. Um, the reason I make the videos, is kind of two parts to it. One is that it documents the things I'm doing and it's a reference point. So when I'm doing a repair or whatever I'm doing, I've got something I can refer back to, and sometimes you get a, you think you fixed it, and then later on you get some other kind of fault, and you can actually look at what happened previously and see how they tie in. So that's one part of it. The other part is to try and help other people which might experience the same fault. So you know you've got a piece of test gear, you've got some kind of you know a fault ABC. Sometimes you'll find that some of those faults are common, and they are recurring faults on that piece of gear because it's like maybe a slight design flaw. Or a particular part was a bit weak or something like that and then you'll see that over and over again on this particular gear so part of the reasons I do it is that it gives people a chance to hopefully make their repairs a bit easier by shortcutting the process of trying to figure out what it is uh, I think a brick is smart on Dumble Trump <laughs> I've got no time for Trump he's an idiot anyway uh, <laughs> we're going to go to politics and, and 
people like that. No, I've got no. no, it's, no. Anyway, so that's part of you know the reason I do it is for reference, it's my own reference, and to try and help people out at the same time and just trying to um, you know, shortcut the process for other people, which would likely see it. this because this came about from I doing a lot of CB work years ago. I used to do a fair bit here. Um, well, relatively fair bit, I suppose, not compared to some other countries where it was really busy. But I'd see the same problems over and over again. And sometimes you could say, okay, I know exactly what that problem is, and you go and fix it within five minutes because I've seen it ten times. And because of that, I thought, right, I'll just do these videos, and that will probably help a lot of people in that way as well, you know? Well, yeah, Boris is in the same camp as Trump, isn't he? I don't know. Maybe not quite so bad. <laughs> Yes, the amount of times I've wished I had a camera running when I've done something or something's gone wrong. Um, yeah, it's like um, there's been many times I've had like smoke escape and it's been missed. You know, I could have been recording that. It happens, you know. So, uh, hmm. Um, the other thing I'm half tempted to play around with. Half tempted. I've still got a bit to go yet. It's this board here. If it'll focus on it, it looks like it might. Um, this is a curve tracer kit. Someone else did a video on this. I think it was at NFM, I think it was. I think it was NFM. Did a video, showed this on one of his videos. And um, I thought that looks interesting, so I bought one. It's on eBay. I think it was of eBay. Pretty sure it was eBay. Um, what was it called? CH-012B. It's just in the bottom of the board there. I don't know if you'll see it or not. Go on, focus on it. Go on. No, that's not going to do it, is it? Anyway, I haven't obviously got it working yet. I've built the kit. That's as far as I've got. I've got a um, a box sitting here. I may, I may not use this box. I'm not sure yet. And it's basically you just hook up to your oscilloscope using XY mode, and um, it, it steps through the various um, voltages on the, on the gate or gate currents, and um, allows you to see the performance of the transistor. <laughs> Hours of solemn video <laughs> looking at a ball and thinking, indeed Dustin, there would be that too. In my, although in my case there'd probably be hours of video of me talking to myself because because I record video as you probably find, you may find it too. Sometimes you sort of start thinking aloud and you know it becomes habitual talking to yourself because you're normally talking to a camera like right now sitting in the room talking to myself you know kind of obviously you're there but thanks from brazil how's it going <coughs> yeah it's been a while since i've heard that saying actually long time It's like my mailbag videos, you saying that, what did I buy that for? Yeah, I had something else the other day, I did the mailbag, I got some parts, it's like, okay, what are these for? Uh, don't remember. I don't know what they are. Actually, I should look them up. Let me, this is going to bug me now, let me quick look them up. LM723. Voltage regulator. Really? Okay. Show up here. Picked up some of these. I don't know why, but I did. Um, it's in this package, dip package. I think someone mentioned them on a video or something like that. Maybe I saw them on somebody else's video, and um, I thought I'd get some because it 
seemed like a good idea. I had a few spare dollars to spend, I don't know. Um, yeah. I think it's using like switch mode supplies and buck figure lights, maybe, I'm not sure. I don't know. Anyway. That does look like a linear system, doesn't it? But yeah, I don't know. I've got, they're cheap. I went and looked at them and thought, oh, they're cheap. I'll get some. And that's about all I remember. Anyway, um, I'll save a dial sheet now I've got it. Um, yeah, I, I don't really know. I don't think I had a particular purpose for them. I just did it. <laughs> uh, yeah, alright, let's just save this PDF file in my data sheets folder. Then I can carry on with what we're doing. Oh, what have you got a data sheet in there for that device? Hmm. Okay. Save the second one, I'll compare them later on. Yeah, anyway. Right. Um, he does help because you start explaining things, you can catch your mistakes. Yeah, that's true. But I tend to find that I don't do as much explaining as I probably should. I mean, I tend to show rather than explain. I think I need to do more of the explaining side, more of the teaching aspect. I think the thing I need to do is um, is that aspect because what I tend to do is just say, "Oh, this is what I'm doing, right? This is what I'm tinkering with today, and you know, this is what I'm doing to fix this." I don't necessarily go through a lot of explaining. I mean, sometimes I do, and like some of the diagnostics videos, I'm getting deep into something. I'm trying to explain how a bit of circuitry works um, on how, why I'm testing it that certain way. So sometimes I do cover it. But probably not as much as I should do. Uh, use a two hundred dollar heating allowance. All oh, right, is that something in the UK? Oh, sorry, two hundred pound heating allowance. So interested in this ball, eh? Um. So NFM did quite a comprehensive build on it. He um, showed the whole thing, building it, put it into the case, testing it out, and that sort of stuff. And I probably will do a video on this, but probably when it's finished, because I think you know you don't really need to see me soldering the board together. Um, I think I did a video on it. Yeah, I think I just sat down and did it. I'm just checking now. No, I've got no video footage recorded for it, so I just sat down and did it. So. I may record some video, I'll put it in a box, maybe, and doing the rest of it, but I'm not sure about using the box I've got here. I'm not completely happy with this box, because it is like a instrument case. It's got like a standing foot on the front, it's like a tilting barrel thing, which pulls out. And... So it's more like an instrument case. It's not really for this. It's the right size, but... Um... I don't really want to use this particular case for it. I've got nothing else that's suitable right now, so that's why I've just got it sitting here because I haven't really finished it. It's one of these half done projects. Um, but yeah, I do want to get that done. And I do intend to do a video on it once it is done and just try and show it working. And because it is a cheap kit. 3D printed box is certainly possible, but it's pretty big. It'll take a long time. I'll just rather just buy one. <laughs> and something that big is likely to fail. Um, unless I get my other printer out, my original Ender 3, which I've done upgrades on, the bed on that is really sticky. It's really good for having stuff not peeled off the bed. Whereas the Ender 3 V2 on the glass bed I've got there, I'm finding it does sometimes tend to lift. So it's not as good. Although it gets dead flat, it's really good for flatness. Adhesion's not so good. So um, it's a trade off. My old Ender 3 isn't dead flat, but adhesion's better. So. Hey, red light. How's it going? Uh, I emitted the amps. I'm familiar with them. I have information on them, but I don't work on amps pretty much. 
Hi, Adam. Um, I do have circuit diagrams. Just find them. I think I have anyway. I, I've got them here somewhere. I know I've got stuff for amps. Um, I have them here somewhere. I don't tend to work on amps. I have worked on amps in the past, but I don't like to because the success rate is not 100%. So what can happen is you can rebuild an amp, spend a lot of money on replacing on transistors and getting the thing working again and you give it back to the person that blow it straight up and it's oh you didn't do it right because it blew up it's like well I tested it fine on my bench and it didn't blow up there <laughs> you've only got an antenna problem or a problem with the coax or a loose plug or something you know <laughs> so the risk is just too great to, to do I just don't do them it's just not worth it IM200 oh yeah that sounds familiar um, I am sure I have diagrams for those amps here somewhere. Um, somewhere. I'm sure I've got them. I'm going to have to look. Try and see if I can find them. Give me a second. The search can't be anything straight away, inconveniently. Let's try and find a folder, but I mean, I can't remember. Somewhere else, okay. Yeah, I don't know. I've got the model three five one. Found that one. I'm sure I've got something here though. I have to try and see if I can find it, but yeah, it could be anywhere. So I don't tend to do amps that much, so it's not something I actually um, keep a track of where I put them. Yeah, I don't know where I put them. I'm sure I've got them though, because I've grabbed those kinds of things in the past and thought, okay, I'll, I'll put that to side, to one side for later on, and try and figure out where it is. Um, so. I'm Sure, I've got here somewhere. Almost, almost finished looking. Ah, here's an accessories folder. This is likely. Hold on. I've got a three five one and a KL two hundred three, but I'm sure I've seen two hundred. I'm sure I've had it. I've looked at it at least. It seems very familiar. Yeah, I don't know. Anyway, I can't find it immediately. Hey, Andrew. Not miss a bit of chat here. Uh, PPTC and VTS diodes. Um, okay. I mean, I've ordered some PTCs and NTCs, so that what I can actually use those in the future. I've been meaning to get them for ages, and um, so when I did that video on the inrush current thing. I use a resistor, right, as a poor man's way of doing it, I suppose. Um, obviously, a PTC would have been the way to go for that. Yeah, what? NTC. NTC. Yeah, something like that. Oh, fuck it. 
you know what I mean. Um, you're missing PCBs turn up today and the parts that eased said I used don't fit. Oh dear. Okay. VTS I'm not sure of. That's not familiar. Um, what's that dial I came across recently? Oh, oh VTS voltage 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 transient suppressor. I guess that's what VTS means, eh? Transient suppressor. So I actually in my IP fifty two hundred, which I was seeing over here, hold on, let me just do that. Maybe I'll do that one. You can see it's sitting there at the top of the end of the desk there. So this is a TV tester. When I was using that on the car to track down the reversing camera, I was using a DC block initially. And I was doing something else. I changed my fittings around and I was reprobing some other stuff. And I forgot to put the DC block back on. And I was probing around trying to find video signals. And then I realized, hold on a minute. I went back to one of the pens which I knew I had a video signal on previously. And it was gone. It's like, what's happened? And anyway, so I realized, oh, no, I've done something. I've probed something I shouldn't have done because I realized I'd taken the DC block off like an idiot. And the IP5200 had a burnt out track inside it. And it had TVS died on it. And um, that had clamped and saved the input circuitry. So TVS, not VTS. Transient voltage suppressor. I think it'd be TVS, not VTS. That's probably what confused me, I think. Um, well, maybe it's different words. Well, maybe. Um, but yeah, there's a, um, a TVS style there, which is, like, I think, 6 volt rated or something like that, or 8 volt rated. I think it was 8 volt rated. And um, yeah, that clamped and shorted out the input and protected the input circuitry. So that was good. But it burnt the track out, which is. You know, acted like a fuse, I suppose. Um, <laughs> dust like <-sick. laughs> Yeah. Um, so I've actually purchased some there. With P, P008A is the part number for those. Must be 8 volt. And um, so I've got to repair the repair, if you know what I mean. I did a bodge at the time, got it working. Still protected, of course. I put a resistor in, in line. Or to put a fuse, definitely nine fuse in there, and um, a Zinna diode because that's what I had, and all the clamp. Um, Transorb, I'm not sure if it's the same thing. Um, anyway, so I did that as a temporary fix to make sure it's still got some kind of protection, but I do want to revisit that and tidy it up and do a better job on it. So I want to take that out and put the um, P008A back in again. So I was planning on doing a video on that and showing how things sometimes don't go quite right. But I don't know if I'm actually going to do it on my channel or I'm going to do it on My Mate Vince. Because My Mate Vince, if you're familiar with it or not, I don't know, um, his channel, he's planning on doing like a Christmas special. Like he did these guest spots for the YouTubers. Um, and he said it, it worked okay, but it wasn't as good as he was expecting it to be. So I didn't, his performance, performance wasn't quite what he wanted for his channel. And so he said what he's going to do is probably just do like a Christmas special. So he, he's going to need some videos around that kind of time, sort of November kind of time, um, from various YouTubers to feature on his channel as like a Christmas special thing. So I'm thinking I might do that particular video for that channel. Because it's quite a nice little complex piece of looking electronics and it's very visual and it's a pretty simple repair but it'd be suited to his audience I think so friends all the same thing you reckon cool use them all ice white five yeah yeah so anything you need to make sure you don't have an over voltage come in and and um, blow up your circuitry then uh, <laughs> Because it clamps and it clamps hard, so um, yeah. So that's what I was thinking of doing is um, doing a video with that 
repair of the repair for my mate Vince's channel and um, have him feature that one. So, because it's a fairly good repair, I mean, it's okay. I mean, it'd be okay on my channel, but I thought it'd be a good one for his channel because he tends to target a different audience to what I'm doing. So, his is a more generic kind of less electronic savvy audience, I suppose. I mean, the people which have an interest in electronics, but don't necessarily have a depth in depth knowledge of it or anything like that. So, I think it's probably a bit more suited to his channel because it would be you know, a good step up for some people which are trying to learn more. I don't know. Hitness Transorb. Oh yeah, okay. USB-C as a result of specs. Yeah, I don't really play with USB-C much. I mean, I only recently got some equipment which had USB-C on it. Uh... Uh, so, some, this is a weird one, right? So, I posted about this on my community page. I went to down and do edit my mailbag video for Monday. And my editor wouldn't work. It wouldn't start up properly. And it's using uh, Adobe Premiere. It's an older version because that's what I use. Cause it's, it doesn't cost me every month. It's just one I've already paid for. And it wouldn't start up. And i recently been given a laptop from work to work from home right because I've been at work for two months and I finally got a spare laptop I think they actually bought me one actually um, and sent that to me and it's all on a VPN it's all super secure network stuff they've got because they're big companies so they're really security conscious so it's all locked down really hard right so I put it on my network and when that computer is turned on on my network my video editing software won't start up it's odd. Very odd. So, um, and yeah, DaVinci wouldn't work either. I couldn't import footage in DaVinci. So, that was weird. Well, I've done that before. Because I just basically, you know, went to try and grab a file and drag it into the program, like the actual MP4 files from, off my camera. And it just, nothing happened. <laughs> So I think it's doing something with my network and maybe doing something odd with my network drives or something. I don't know. Anyway. But once that computer was turned off, it's fine. I could hit it again. Very curious. It's called Transorb more than TVS. Okay. Yeah. DRM. I don't know. But it's weird, weird, you know, because to have that computer affecting this computer in that way was a bit odd. I mean, the files are all stored on this computer. They're not on like a network drive. But I do have network drives on the system. So I'm thinking maybe when um, Premiere was booting up, it was trying to map the drives and see what drives were available. And maybe it couldn't access something or was being blocked by the other computer because of the VPN set up on it. And that was making it lock up. I, I don't know. It was odd. Yeah. Um, the other thing I was going to look at. You know, let's go and have a tick on the bench over here. I've been waffling enough. Let's go and have a tick on the bench. And um, I'll show you these. Jumper link things, four way jumper links, because they're pretty cool. I like them. I'm not making sense. You're not making sense. Anyway, right. Let's get some lighting over there. Uh, let's do that camera view. Oh, the computer interactions, yeah, right, yeah, it's just old. Um, actually, something else, I'll, I'll, before we go over there, actually, before we go over there, I shall turn this on. Hold on. So, I'm going to play around this week. Now, last week, I started playing around with writing software. Um, 
which I half built. I actually had it working. It's for the. What was I working with? Multimeter, yeah, the signal STM3065X, my multimeter. So I built software for that. Well, kind of built it, it's not actually finished, but. And someone else commented on the EV blog forum about this test controller software which somebody else has been building. It's using Java, so it's pretty universal. And I thought, okay, well, I was going to have a look at that, and it actually turned out that there's already support for my multimeter on it, so it's like, okay, well, I don't need this then. And then I ended up building a device definition file for the SDL1030X, which is actually my SDL1020XE, which is a f kind of hand, and um, which is a DC electronic load. So I built a definition file for that. Then I built a definition file for the East Tester LCR meter. Um, that was a challenge. It was easy to get it to control a device. Controlling it was easy. I had to go in like an hour. Um, but trying to read the readings from it was a pain. It took me a couple of days to get that sorted out with the help of the guy which does the software. So if you're on the EV blog forum and you look in the test equipment, there's a post in there about um, software to read from, multi, from different multimeters or something like that. I can't remember exactly what it was called now. And um, I've been in there. So a definition file is basically a text file. So it's um, I shall show you one. Let me get it up, and I shall show you it. And you can see what I'm talking about. Show this up here. Just uh, do this. So this is the definition file I built for the signal DC load. So well, it's going to count on camera here for you guys, but on screen. But it's basically a test file, and you just def define. The different variants of the device and what needs to change between them. Like in this case, that's 200 watts or 300 watts definitions. And just a bunch of notes and stuff like that in here. And this is how it actually reads values from it and modes it can do. There's a whole bunch of stuff in here for that. So interface stuff which I haven't actually used yet, but it's there. This is some of my own definitions here to track modes in the Windows. Bit of a roundabout way of doing it, but it worked. Um, this is the actual mode window, so I'll show you this in a minute. I'll follow it up, maybe, and show you. Actually, I'll follow it. I'll turn it on. And I'll turn all these devices on. I'll show you the software here, running. This is basically how you build a mode window. So it's a window with the buttons in it for changing modes. And then down here is the setup window. So this is where you can choose various configuration options and like that which you saw in this bit which is all what I had to write is all this stuff here um, it's just different tabs or different panels so it can hide and show different sections depending on what mode you're in so constant resistance constant power constant voltage and so on and you've got dynamic which is a switching one it's programmable this took me a while to write this one the battery mo testing mode, or battery simulation mode, I think it is. Over current protection, no voltage as over power protection settings, and some other switching stuff down here. So it's like a thousand lines just for the SDL. Um, then I did one for the East Tester, which is the LCR meter. Um, this one's a bit simpler. All the first parts basically the same, but this. Um, this is where it has to try and figure out what the readings are, what mode it's in. This is the bit which took the time to get sorted out, getting this bit working. Um, the mode selection stuff was, again, it's the same code here, just tracking modes. And then this is the actual selection. This is this was easy to get down, that's just worked pretty quickly. And you've got some more options stuff here for setup window. 
Anyway, let's get this stuff here fired up and I'll show you it. Now the reason I wanted to do this is because also I did a definition for the Roshui um, VC409 and 4091. Someone else on the platform had that meter. It's basically the same meter. It looks identical. But the firmware is slightly different. It doesn't work quite the same way. So let's just load this up. And you can see at the bottom of the window there I've got a grid panel. Which has popped up. So that shows me a multimeter. What I've got coming out of there. And you can't see the cursor. <laughs> yeah, I'll put it on the top window. See it just there. There's the multimeter. Um, there is the. Uh, where's the there we go. There's the cursor. Um, there's the East tester just here. And these are the electronic load and to control stuff over here. I'll turn the various things on. So if I want to do this to the 3065, I've got a window popped up which you can't see because I'm not sharing that part. I'll bring it up here. So this is the mode section for the multimeter. Um, if I bring up the setup window for the multimeter, this is what somebody else has done. Somebody else wrote this. Um, Mike Ludd, I think it was. And as you change modes, it changes the windows up here for the different setting options. That's what he'd written. But I've done something very similar to this. If I do the East Tester, bring this up here. So that's East Tester mode, so literally capacitors, normal capacitors, stuff like that. So let's bring up the setup menu, which is here. So again, this window here will change depending on what you're actually doing as well. So it will only show you what um, options are suited to that particular test mode. Right, so these resistance doesn't need frequency and stuff like that, for instance. So it's, a lot of them are the same. Then you've got the secondary functions like ESR and what have you here. And they do show up down the bottom here, but it's actually looking a bit small. Let's switch over a bit more. Here we go. Make the text bigger. Right, so that's all down the bottom here. Uh, just below there, so you can see what's going on. Dissipation, for example, shows up. So that's what I wrote this week, was that one. And um, then we've got the, the electronic mode as well. Bring this up here. Modes and setup window. So I took a lot of time, so constant current mode, constant voltage mode, and so on. All right. Different modes it does, and it shows you what it supports. Um, you've got these other options here for doing over power protection, over current protection. You can set those up. Battery simulation mode, and you've got that. So, it's got a utility pane, which I had to put on a different side of switching system, which gives you general setup stuff like outputs, you know, what if you're using the outputs on the back, and things like that, and turn the load on and off over here as well. That sort of stuff. And that's on every window that. So yeah, so that's what I'm playing with. And it just beeped because it said it, the, the battery is finished because I'm on battery mode. So, yes. But the idea was to have a panel which um, displays along the bottom here, which means you can see the meters. And when I'm doing testing on the bench, I could be using the multimeters up on the bench and you can see the readings. That's the plan, anyway. That's what I was intending to do. Let's bring this bit narrow. Should go there somewhere. Alright, read the chat. Um. Yeah, so basically what the definition file is doing there, David, is, um, oh, sorry, Adam, get it right. Um, the 
Hey, Christian. The it's just telling the software how to interpret the device and how to communicate with the device. So it's got like Skippy codes in there, so you can send commands and read the device readings. Um, so it's not my software. This is um, HKJ on the forum. So. Oh, Johnny's gone. Catch you later, Johnny. But there's other stuff I want to do to this software, so I actually want to have definitions for things like my multimeters behind me here. So I've got my Datron 7 off digit, the 8082, I've got sitting there. I want to get that one set up on it. And the Calibrator and that kind of stuff, the Datron 4700. I want to get all my test gear over here on that system as well. Now, because they're all GPIB based, it's a bit trickier. I have to use one of these LAN to GPIB adapters, one of them. That's why I bought them. Um, not connected up currently, but they will be connected up. I've got to get that. God, that's another project I need to finish. Get these on there. But you can't currently see them pointing yet because it's this window. Here we go. These things here. All right, he's right here. All right, so these I need to get hooked up to my test gear over here. Then I can get those multimeters on it. And I could put them across the display as well. Or, I mean, the actual, like, the actual um, buttons here, which you can't see the cursor on, which is a shame. It'd be nice if you could see the cursor on those buttons. But um, but the mode setup buttons there, I could remove those that need to be on there. And I could just have a whole bunch of measurements across it. Um, yeah, so it's a pretty good little bit of software. It's very versatile. It just it takes a bit to get a definition file written, but it's been. A bit of an open source kind of community project, All right? So lots of people are contributing to the definition file. So when somebody has a device which needs a definition written, they've written the right one for it, and um, then that becomes part of the um, available devices with the software when you download it. So it's free. There's no cost for it. It's, it's free as well. It's all, there's no charge for it. So let's just um, show you the devices around it right now. So those ones I showed you before, just like my the ones I've been playing with. Um, this is the device list here. So this is what's currently supported. And what you actually find is a lot of devices in here will be very similar to other devices, or they have the same kind of system or the same design. So you can actually tweak one. And if you've got something which is the same manufacturer you might find there's a lot of similarities or it's like a different kind of power supply but um, or whatever it may be multimeters or whatever um, and you can actually just clone one of these but there's one here for the may now DC loads as well which I also own if I can grab the window no, this is a DC load for the now this one's got a fair bit in it but it's allows all the different ones but somebody else wrote this um, it may have an author name in there somewhere. You see, it was different variants of it. Look at all. Most of it is definitions. And this is where I actually start getting to the code. So, and there's a whole bunch of Skippy command. So this is using a conversion system. But, um, yeah, the actual bit to handle it is small. Most of definitions. So it depends on what you actually want to do. If you want to make a definition, you can make one which is extremely simple, which just controls it, or you can have one that just reads it. You can make it as complicated as you want, I suppose, but um, you can either just support only a few functions of the device, or you can support everything. It's called Test Controller. It's on the UV Blog Forum. Um, who would it call? I'll try and put a link. I'll, I'll find the link for it. I'll put it up. Let me do that. It'll be easier. <clears throat> but I thought this would be something you guys would be interested in. If you want to, you, know, you don't have to do auto, full on automation. You can just like do what I'm doing to do. Well, the tension was to do screen capture stuff with the readings. You can do that. So where is it? Just gotta find it. It's called program that can log from many multimeters. All right, I'll copy that link and I'll paste it in the chat. Here 
if I can click on it. Here we go. Right. But yeah, this is what the um, main window looks like. So you also got current readings as well, so we can do a readout here. Um, I've not got any logging turned on right now, so I won't show much else, but you can do logging on it and you can actually do instrument control from it as well. Um, you can do some remapping if you need to remap some stuff. Device info, IP addresses, that sort of stuff. It's how you configure the communication. And just other basic software stuff here for the actual program itself. Um, but you can send it skippy commands and like from here, it's like a command line, you can send it directly commands here and you choose a device, you have to right click and change the device which one you want to talk to and you can send a command. So um, like if I wanted to do this thing here, I could do a fetch and this is current readout up here. So yeah, that's how it returns the result. Anyway, um, so that's what I'm playing with this week, <laughs> as well as doing the work from the laptop being turned up from work. So once that arrived, I'll actually do some work and um, try and catch up with some stuff. I had hundreds of emails here to go through. It took me ages to get through those. I'll be given a project to do as well to try and keep me busy. Uh, lab Windows CVI. Yeah, it depends I mean, when it comes to writing software. Um, you can do all sorts of stuff. I mean, if you can send a serial command to something, you can control it or read it. You know, you probably use an Arduino to do it if you wanted to. <laughs> um, so the Siglent, both the Siglent meters are on LAN. And the East Tester LCI meter is on USB. So it doesn't have to be on the same network either. So, yeah, that's all right. Is there a program to match voltage with amps? Amp draw like a linear and 10 meter radio and still near the 12 volts. So, yeah, I don't know what it is. Max amp draw 24 12 system. Um, not aware of, Mark. Not for me, but anyway. Uh, David, I haven't really played the road sports that much. No, it seems to sit there and I turn it on from time to time. And I remember that I've got one. <laughs> Pretty much sits there. I mean, that's GPIB as well. I think it might have down there on serial connections too. So that's something I could also hook up to it if I really wanted to get the road and sports on it. I'm not sure I've got this in our place. I mean, maybe I should put this thing at the top instead of at the bottom. I don't know. I don't know. Anyway. Can it go to the GPI controller? It doesn't have a GPIB. I don't think. I'm not going into the GPIB side of it that much. I know it works on USB. I know it works on LAN. GPIB is supported, but I think you have to use a, a USB to LAN. Or a LAN to GPIB or USB to GPIB adapter, something like that. Um, I have both. I've got a USB and a LAN adapter. I haven't tried using LAN adapters yet. I have used the GPIB to USB adapter before, and that was kind of working. I was playing with it before, um, kind of. I had some issues with it. I, th I think the instruments themselves didn't like being on the same bus together or something. I'm not quite sure exactly what it was. I haven't pinned that down yet. That's why I bought these because I was going to try doing a LAN system instead, but I haven't got around to playing with it yet. Um, 
So in theory, it should be able to do the GPIB stuff as well and um, send commands that way, but I haven't played with that yet. That's the next thing I want to do is try and get these working on GPIB and all that complexity, which means setting up these LAN to GPIB adapters for a start. Um, draw and line the alternator with a linear and 10 meter radio. Oh, so you're trying to, okay, Mark, so you're trying to determine how much power you need. Well, there's, there'd be online calculators you could potentially use to do conversions if you needed to do that. Um, for doing like general electronics conversions, you could do those. There's lots of calculators for Ohm's law kind of thing, power conversions, you know, voltage and current to power. But when you're talking about linear amplifiers, they also have a matter of loss, so and radios. So if you've got a 300 watt linear, then you might find you're using 400 watts to run it, for example, you know. Um, I'll just try to understand what you're trying to do there, Mark. Um, well, I always say don't max things out. So if you've got a, in your case, a 90 amp alternator, I wouldn't be trying to draw it at 90 amps because it will kill it. It'll be a surge of maximum or short term loading. You know, you, you'd probably assume 50% of that for continuous, be a safe margin, maybe more, but then you also got to run a car and all the other accessories of the car as well. So I'm assuming you're doing it in a car. So, um, Yeah, um, hey Curie, I didn't even know you were there. <laughs> hello, goodbye. I must have missed you saying hello, maybe, I don't know. Um, yeah, anyway, let's get rid of that. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, that's curious. I quit the app and the window is still showing. <laughs> Does it go away for doing that? No, it's still there. Oh, that's interesting. So I've quit the Java app, right, which is the test controller app, and the window still shows up. That is interesting. launch it again let me try something else I want to get rid of that window with that let me vanish that it is there if I close the window it's still there oh, that's interesting so I stopped updating when I closed it it stopped updating the values but it's still sitting there that's Curious. Hmm. Okay, Andrew, thanks for dropping by. Java's not cleaning up, no. It seems to be leaving the window behind. Or oh, it's an ABS quirk where it's storing the last frame, which is weird. Okay. Weird. Oh. Um, I was going to be sitting there the whole time doing nothing. Hmm. What if I... Try 
try and refresh it like this. No. That's weird. No, it's disappeared. Okay. Right, it does recognise it's gone. I can't select it anymore. Now I have to select something else. It's, you know, silly, but... Okay. Right, so if I go and select it, well, unselect it, change it to something else, and then cancel, it disappears. Right. That's weird, but yeah, OBS did recognise it was gone, but I think it's an OBS quirk that is holding onto it. You found a program, cool. Hey Rob. Yeah, I was probably just playing around because I was going to these settings. All right. Anyway, let's go go over to the desk. It's been promising for ages, or threatening for ages. I know which one you want to. Let's turn this off. Turn that off. I might need the multimeter going. So these are the things that turned up. go to a slightly better angle. I don't really can see that actually. Maybe I'll use the camera. Maybe I'll use the camera. Right? Might be better than I am. Wait for it to turn on. There we go. Let me give you a slightly better view like this. Let me try and get it in focus. How's that sound? Something like it anyway. Oh, don't forget to click like and subscribe. Okay. Hopefully the mic audio is okay over here. Sort of try and have a look. And yeah, it seems to be. Right. So what I got sent with these kits. Obviously this guy's making them at home or something, but they're nicely done. So we've got a bunch of these large Eskers tweezers. The banana plugs, which have got these screw fittings on the end. All right, so we've got four of them. So it's also made this little case and enclosure for it as well. It's also made all this. I'm not sure it's been CNC'd out or what. I think it's CNC'd. It's multiple layers, so I'm not sure. Maybe it could be laser cut and then laid down, or sure. Um, so it's done a really nice job presenting them. You know, it's obviously homemade stuff, but it looks good. This is where you can find it. That's what it's from, but we got it off eBay. And it's so uh, he recognised me, and he says he liked my videos, so he, he sent me some extra bits. So that was nice of him. So this one's a like a resistor jumper. So this is a four-way jumper. Well, it's actually a two-way jumper, but it's also got a resistor here. So you can actually put a standard resistor across it. I'm trying to get in focus again. All right, so you can just see the traces on there, like that. So you see you've got the different patterns you can do. So it obviously links this side together and that side together. And you can put a resistor in here, like maybe a full wire resistor, even so it's obviously doing that. So, you put a standardized test resistor in there. So, if you've got like a one mega ohm resistor you have to use or something when you're doing calibration work, you could preload it onto the board, or you could put a link in there and just make it a full wire jumper. All right, and it's adjustable, so you've got the standard um, layouts and you can move it around as you need to. So, it's quite a nice design. So with that one there, and 
This one here is a little bit different. This one's a standard four wire, 19 mil. Oh, yep. Right, goes that way up. So there you go, it's a standard four wire jumper. And what this rib piece is, I should show you actually, this is just a handle. So you mount that on there so you can just plug it in and out a bit more easily. Now, interestingly, this package, when I got it, I'll just put it back the way around. Um, the first one here, this one, had been opened, right? So the whole package had been opened when I received it. It had, it had a note on it saying it had been inspected by whoever, whoever the, the agency is that does the import stuff. I can't remember what it was now. It said something. It wasn't customs, it was something else. Um, it said it had been inspected, opened it for inspection. That's fine, I don't mind opening stuff down and look at it, make sure there's nothing dodgy in there. But this one here came with this, but there's no plastic housing for it. So I don't know, is it, was it supposed to have one? I mean, I'm thinking there should have been a plastic surround for this one. Like this. Okay, this is another four wire link, but this is a different one. This is for Datrons. So, yeah, focus, there you go. So, yeah, four wire link for Datrons. Now, I actually think that I should have had something like this on the other unit. This one's not the right one for that one, it's a different size. But it does make me a little suspicious that maybe. When I open up, they might have lost a piece. Oh, this one here, what's this one? Oh, maybe not. This one's the same. This one's exactly the same as the first one. So maybe it wasn't, though. Maybe it's not an issue. That must mount on there a little differently. Maybe it goes on here somewhere. I don't know. I have to figure that one out. Um, maybe not then. Look at the back of the board. I shouldn't look at the back of the board. The other one. Yeah. Yeah. They look like nice boards. You know, it's obviously, it's inked as well. Inked gold. So quality's there. So I, I've got these in the mailbag video. And I'll be links to the um, eBay listing. I think I'll be, yeah, it's, it's the mobile video that comes out tomorrow. So you'll see this in there. I've got links to the listing and that sort of stuff there. So um, that's all pretty good. But yeah, so you can put the. You've got, on what I'm doing, like the Dashon calibrations, there's a certain configuration you have to use to the calibration of Dashon. You have to use a certain visitor value and a capacitor as well across the junction and I'm hoping I could use these for those dashing calibrations. I'm not sure if I can use this particular board or if I can just do some other way, I'm not sure. But um, having a proper jumper link and just plug in with the four wire jumper link, that's great. So um, and over here, maybe this one I need these other bits here you sent. I'm not at these yet. Maybe these are for the Datron. Those, um, Datron, the um, other thing. So, maybe that's the one that's supposed to go on this board. Yeah, that'd be it. That's the one that goes on there. Okay, that's the one that goes for that. Okay, that's fine. So, that's what happens. So, these got bolted onto this board here. And it's got a clearance in there for the resistor. It's got high sense markings on it on the uh, 3D printer as well, and then you put the handle on the front. Okay, that's how it goes. You get the handle back out, so then the handle goes on there. Sweet. So it's good. Um, but yeah, it was a bit annoying. I'm trying to work on the electrons and, and the, even the HP three four five six I've got up there as well. Of course, the banana jacks aren't. A 19 mil square spacing like they are these like the 
the signal multimeter up here. That's a 19 by 19, right? Um, but those other meters, they're not. They've got this other weird spacing, so that's why I wanted to get these. So then I can put, make these four wire jumpers up for those things and and plug into those and do a proper short wire link instead of trying to link them all together in other ways. Um, I do have some other jumpers which can be stacked, which is what I did before, and putting like a link between them, that sort of stuff. But it's not as nice as a proper four wire jumper we've plugged straight in the front and that's it. Um, that is a bit more precise. So, yeah, this all looks nice enough. Good. And the other thing I picked up, that I do also show in my bag, is this riser card here. So, this is also off eBay. And it's a Marconi 2955 riser card. So this guy makes riser cards and things like that. You can actually make them in order as well. So if you want a, a certain type or a certain style, I believe you can make them as well. So you just say what, what, what you want. So you know, the actual spacings you need on the connections and thickness of the board maybe, I'm not sure. Um, kind of connectors on it, that sort of stuff. And I think you can make them custom. And obviously he's had someone make, or well, request a Marconi 2955 in the past and he's once it's got the design and it's stuck to my eBay. So these are basically like a kit. So he does put the socket on the end, but he doesn't solder all the legs on. It's just solder some on there to hold it in place. And then you have to come along afterwards and when you get it and, and fully assemble it yourself. Um, obviously you'd be paying more, obviously. I'd rather solder it myself and save a few dollars, you know. Um, but yeah, so that is for when I need it eventually. That is going to happen. <laughs> you can guarantee it's going to happen. Um, yeah. And I fished this out the other day. It's an LOPT or flyback tester. So this is for testing um, transformers basically. So this is intentionally well, designed based on testing CRT high voltage transformers. And so this will tell you how many rings you get at the transformer, see if you've got a transformer problem. So the more rings you get, the more healthy the transformer is. Um, because if you've got any shorter windings, it will basically kill the resonation, resonation, the resonance of the transformer. So I fished this out the other day because I've, I've never really used it. I've got it. Oh, what well, was it um, when I was working on IMAX, the original IMAX? The, I don't remember those polycarbonate case ones with the... CRT screen, your know, original IMAX coloured ones, oh, 20 odd years ago. Um, yeah, so I got this originally when I was doing them to test the transformers because um, they were a problem. They were failing. The actual, oh, I actually ended up doing conversions. I actually converted the whole iMac into a, a PC case and did a whole conversion process on that. And that, I did a few of them. That was a waste of time, really. Didn't make any money on it, it wasn't really worth it amount of money and time I put into it. Anyway, so I've got this out because on my, well in my other lab there I've got a, hello George, my cat's in here. So, what's, what was I going to say? In my other lab I've got a Cobra 29 CB and it has an issue with the transmit audio being weak. Receive audio is fine. And I've been playing around with the transformer the audio transformer on it, and if I put a dial in series, the transmit um, audio gets really good, but then the receive audio is rubbish. <laughs> so, hmm. so I actually want to stick this on it and try and actually check the resonance of that transformer in case it's got a shorter term transformer, and compare it to another Cobra 29 with the same transformer on it, and just do the same test. So, this I want to play with at some point as well in the future. So, I'll see on my desk as another, yet another half done project. Hey, George. It's coming over here, missed loads of chat, I'm sure. All right. Um, right, where are we? Hey, Ray. Need a little while. All right. How long was I waffling for? 10 minutes? <laughs> um, too much. About that supply system thing. Why 
What's in the bubble wrap? Yeah, that's what I was plastic bits where we covered that. Um, check my silver's great. I'm skimming through. Ring a tester. Yeah, I've seen someone else do it. It might have been Dog Dog on Wild. Um, yeah, might have been him. I saw do one. It might have been him. I saw it recently. Yeah, I saw it recently. It might have been Dog on Wild. That's probably what I put it in my, in my head is that I've got one, you know? I think it was his. Yeah, it's gonna bug me now. Um, yeah. Anyway, to those little four way plug things, they're uh, linked in the mailbag tomorrow, which Patreons and members have access to. So if you want to see those, you can straight to the stream. But yeah, they look pretty good. Um, the quality looks good. It? it does look like a homemade job, you know, the whole packaging stuff looks homemade, but it looks like it's been done very nicely. It's like someone trying to make an effort and do a quality job, so it looks professional for a home person, if you know what I mean. Um, it looks good. Yeah. Um, my throat's getting dry. Let's see if I can order a coffee. Let's see. Text my wife, say, coffee. Um, I suppose I'll put some love hearts after that, shouldn't I? As soon as I'm texting my wife, I should do something. There you go. Right. <laughs> See if I can order a coffee up. Waiting to hear something. Get away. I'm just listening. I can hear footsteps. And cups clanking. Looking promising. <laughs> Might work. Yeah, anyway. Um, it's George. There she is. I think I've seen George before in previous videos because she hangs around in here now. Come here, George. So, here's George. Died. great um, yeah I think I'm, I'm sure I saw it somewhere recently which is what made me think oh I've got something on there so I fished it out it's amazing how many bits of weird bits of test gear I've got lying around it's like and I sort of completely forget about them and something will prompt me go oh yes right, I've got something on like that and before you know it I go oh yeah I've got three of those now sort of thing that happens on I might bed let's turn this back off again Nice cat, well, room service indeed. Okay, so I use CCM GPSDO. Not familiar with that device. I mean, I thought a GPSDO would lock within 10 minutes, probably. Um, I mean, sometimes they are ovenized as well, 
and so they do have the oven warm up time and then they stabilize from that I mean I've got one which um, I did show in a mailbag once and I haven't actually used it yet I've got it sitting out in the other room I haven't got it hooked up yet I've got it out there to hook up I've done it yet but the um, that's got an oven-ized oscillator in it as well and it, it's got the oven oscillator warm up time and obviously then the GPS lock and then it stabilizes so it took about I think it was basically 15 minutes 10 15 minutes but that was pretty stable then um, maybe a bit longer can't be exactly but yeah I wouldn't thought we were taking two hours I don't know what stories are that I'm not familiar with that particular device so I can't really give you much advice on that Yeah, Mark, I'm not really sure about your thing. You're saying up converted. You mean down converted? Are you going from 24 volts down to 12 volts or 13.8 volts? Are you? I'm, I'm not quite sure. Hey, yeah, Mako. Fluke 6061 6061 Oh, uh, hold on, let me think. Oh, that that took him over. Oh. Bash him on your lead. Hmm. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I had a 6060B. I'll do a look. I, I've done five videos on that device. That was one of the first videos I did. Oh, it's one of the early videos. That is back in. God, it's five years ago. Um, yeah. I covered a lot of stuff in our videos using what I had at the time it's a very hand cam video before I started using tripods and stuff hmm yeah fluke 6060b if you do a search for that it will probably find out probably find it on YouTube. I don't think there's many 6060B videos on YouTube. Yes, I mean, it's one of the reasons I like this older gear. It's amazing how long it goes on for. If you look after it and you take care of it and you replace the parts which need replacing, you know, capacitors mostly, um, keeps on going. So the um, it's one of my concerns about newer equipment. You know, you don't know how long it's going to really last. Is it going to last five years? Is it going to last ten years? Is it going to last twenty? It might last twenty. Don't know. But when they do eventually fail, because you know, everything fails eventually, will they be repairable? You know, what's going to fail? If it's power supplies, you're probably fine, depending on what happens to it. Um, but I don't think the modern equipment's going to be as repairable as the stuff which has come before. So that's my concern. I mean, I, I do have some modern gear here, obviously. Um, yes, Mike, I do have a great wife. And I'm very fortunate. So that that's a concern I have is that you know, as things age, are they still going to be repairable? Um, you know, the older gear I do like because they are 
a lot of the time jelly bean kind of parts you know as the saying goes and you know it's basically recapping it most of the time and also the repairs I do is recapping and potentially repairing the damage from capacitor failures or some random IC or something like you know op amp failure whatever yeah that's the thing eh? some of those specialist chips are hard to get and that's also a risk there too so yeah when you got these special devices then that's the problem you know and you never get one like you say you never, unless you find a another broken unit and you can salvage them from it um, yeah modern stuff trying to get service manual schematics that sort of stuff and modern stuff mm, even Keysight I don't think offers it anymore on at least current modules I'm not sure um, I know the older gear they still had them available on the website but I think anything that's a current model I don't have the circuit diagrams for at least I don't make them public so yeah and a lot of the gear and I've got some manuals for my sequence stuff but I don't think it goes too deeply um, let me have a look now I do have something there because I do have stuff on the website on the sequence stuff um, let's go to SDM Um, 3065X service manual that's what they call it at least so this is on the website so you can actually download this off the website so that's fine yeah, this is shrink it down a bit and make it a bit easier to scroll through 43 pages which doesn't sound like much yeah there's the guides there so that gives you general specifications for checking accuracy and performance data so you have to check whether it's working correctly George is back um, and that's what a lot of this is functional checks you know preset settings that sort of stuff performance verifications so you know how to make sure it's actually working as it should calibration yes well this is a secret well it's a secret but I know it and I do have a video recorded on how to do the calibration I just haven't published it yet because I'm waiting for Siglant to kind of say yes that's okay you can publish it because I don't want to annoy them um, software to use because they actually use in the calibration they actually have a well, the primary calibration using a preset script for a certain equipment and this is hinting at it a little bit um, for the calibration stuff I can make it slightly bigger again for you um, but yeah it's telling you to use their script now there is a manual calibration process which is what I'm familiar with and it tells you how to get it apart wiring diagram troubleshoot information some of the layout stuff's in there though it's not the highest resolution I mean it's very much yeah it's kind of there but it's not the best it's like it's a lower resolution graphic that does some test points and stuff marked main board so there's some information here you know some stuff which is handy like power supply stuff um, which to be honest you know if this is what goes wrong with it then you know you probably cover anyway test points and analog board so that, you know, it's not worthless. It's definitely helpful um, for narrowing down what could potentially go wrong. But as far as circuit diagram goes, no circuit diagrams. So that's all you get is you don't get a block diagram. You get a layout and a troubleshooting guide, basically to 
test power supplies. But it's still better than nothing. You know, some people don't put anything out. Um, so, in that regard, it's good because Siglant have at least put out something. You know? It would be nice to see circle diagrams, plot diagrams. Maybe one day they will. Who knows? But uh, it's better than nothing. Yeah, that's right, Rob. I mean, we'll see. I mean, things are silly days, though, right? So this new gear, whilst it's still relatively new, you're not expecting much to go wrong with it, really, okay? It's either going to be failed when you first open it up because there's some kind of manufacturing fault or glitch or shipping damage or something, you know? Um, or it'll be fine for a number of years. So at this stage, because they're relatively new... You wouldn't expect to see much in the way of failures, but in five, ten years' time, when things do start to age, and maybe they'll be all right. I don't know. I guess time will tell. But um, but it's good that Siglant do at least put out something. You know, lots of other manufacturers manufacturers are putting out nothing at all. Yeah, who knows what's going to happen in the future? I mean, I don't know. With a start. I mean, you can't rely on internet connections, right? Because a great example was where I am. Interconnection where I am is flaky. It depends. Sometimes it's absolutely fine, no issues. Other times, it is rubbish. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's. It's one of these things, sometimes it can vary a bit. And relying on internet connection is not good. I mean, if you're having to be somewhere where there is no internet connection or there's no internet network for security reasons, I'm sure there's places like that, then um, you know that would be a problem if you're trying to use network-based control systems or internet-based control systems or verification or software activation. Yeah, I'm sure the last, you know, I expect these things will probably last 10 years at least, Rob. You know, at least 10 years, I expect. Because as you say, there's not really much to go wrong with them. Um, but, you know, there's no guarantees you can't get a, you know, except to any instrument, you, you could get a slightly dodgy part where it's not been designed right. It could be a, a bad op amp or something somewhere or a slightly weak resistor who knows you know and it could just blow even know. who knows who knows what can happen um, but I mean it would be nice to think that the modern gear will last 20 years it would be nice but only time will tell really you know, I think with miniaturization and the fact that a lot of stuff is now going to processes and into code instead, it does mean there's less things to go wrong. You know, if you've got some older gear, you've got multiple boards which basically make up a computer, you know, you've got loads of things in there which could potentially go wrong. And so, being it's in software now, the chance of something going wrong is much less, but there's still a chance. You know, checking reefer caps <laughs> or cracking reefer caps, yeah, well, I think that's an issue these days. I mean, reefer caps last 20 years before they start to fail. I wouldn't really think they'd be an issue. Even even if reefer caps were in modern gear, which I think potentially they could be, um, then, you know, it wouldn't really be an issue until they get really old anyway. And then it's just, it'd be like a maintenance thing. Just like electrolytic caps, you know. After 10 years, literally caps would probably need replacing. Well, I mean... The, it depends on your definition of what's cheap. I mean, what you get for your money these days is really good, but is it cheap? Not really. I mean, if, if like, take a look at my signal multimeter, for example, okay? 
that has got so many features in it. It can do so much. I, you know, I barely use any of it, to be honest. Um, you know, it's got the online graphing and all sorts of things it can do. And, and having this test controller software working with it um, opens up some options there for things I want to do as well. Um, but what was the point I was going to make? I've forgotten the point I was going to make. Oh yes, the, the, the money. So it can do so much, and for the money, it is cheap considering what it can do. But if you look at a replacement perspective, as a hobbyist, for example, right? If you a hobbyist spent, I don't know, I don't know what he's since retail for now. I don't know. I'm, I must be. I don't know what he's retail for. I'm just going to I'm just going to say a thousand dollars. Right? I could be completely wrong. I don't remember what it would cost me. Um, I'm sure Bob would know. But if it's a thousand dollars to replace that meter, for example, just putting a number out of the year. And as a hobbyist, you would say, oh, um, I can't really afford a thousand dollars of meter work. I'll have to maybe spend three hundred dollars and get something not as good um, because that's what I can afford at the time. You know, if it's a business, then it's not really an issue. You know, you just they just buy what they need and tax write-offs and so on and what have you. Um, uh, yeah, so, oh, Rob says, XY caps on different plastics, yes. The old caps would be polycarbonate, I think, the shells. Polycarbonate does crack. Um... Polycarbonate is tough because it absorbs impact, and it absorbs impacts by cracking. It gets micro cracks, and obviously when you got a crack in through a sealed component like that, and moisture gets in, that's when they go bad. Um, I'm not sure what plastic they're using now. I don't know, it might be polypropylene something like instead now. It might be using polypropylene. So it's a bit of a different beast. Um, yeah, I don't know. Anyway, I'm speculating here. Um, but yeah, I'm going on different tangents all over the place. Well, that's true for it. You know, if it's if it's cheaper than a time so it cost the engineer to to fix it, then they'll just buy a new one. Which in a way is a, a good thing because it puts stock on eBay, which gives me things to buy. But, uh, yeah. Uh, plastic and throw away lighters. Well, I thought it would have been a styrene or something. I don't know. Um, no, it wouldn't be a styrene. I'm not sure what it would be, actually. I don't know about all plastics, I only really know about the ones I've come in contact with and used. Um, sorry for what stays that if on, thanks. What do you mean? Bakelite, well, it's a thermoset plastic from. A long time ago, it's fairly brittle though, so mm, it's thermo sets which are different, which don't melt. Um, oh. There's loads of plastics, there's, there's hundreds of different kinds of plastics out there, and I'll probably know. A small, a really small percentage of them. So we've got thermoplastics and thermosetting plastics. So thermosetting means they will only be melted once. They have a chemical reaction. Once they've melted once, they're locked into that shape. You cannot remelt them. All right? And a thermoplastic means you can remelt it over and over again. Kind of. To a point, um, but 
so much sets are, um, are that exactly that's a chemical reaction they actually set in that shape and you can't remelt them they may char turn to charcoal or they may burn but they won't melt things like rubbers think about rubber that's a thermo set silicons like the silicon mats and stuff like that no? very similar silicone silicon sorry no. Yeah. Anyway. <sighs> really wish I had something to work on. I actually need some test gear. I've been trying to find polyether on my mind. I'm not sure that is. It's new one on me. You want to buy an Andon Star 403? What was mine? Was it 407 or 409? I can't remember. Um, the Andon Star microscope's been really good. I've had a couple of them. Got another one there. And they're both good quality. They work well. Come back mailbag video while you watch. Um, I don't have any mail. I have a big slowdown in mail. I haven't had much coming in. I had enough stuff to do two mailbag videos which I only just recorded and um, that's what I got over a period of a couple of weeks and just did them did two at one go. Throw 70 bought one, yeah. Um, I've got one package. I've only got one package here. I know what's in it. It's not that exciting. Um, so I, I don't want to do I, I, I basically need to do at least five items for mailbag I try and have at least five items um, maybe six or seven if I can depends on what I've got but I've been waiting for some stuff for ages and it's just not coming through I had to actually do some claims and things have just disappeared DGUV3 test, I'm not sure what that is. I'm guessing it's some kind of safety inspection, is it? Main safety inspection or something, is it? I don't know. I'm not doing stuff commercially, so it's just for me, the stuff I'm fixing. So I will do stuff on my own peace of mind, such as earth continuity tests and stuff like that. I don't really show in videos. I've shown it sometimes, but not often. Um, now to make sure you've got less than one ohm resistance between the earth pin on the plug and the casing of the instrument, that sort of thing. Um, mentioning PEI, PEI sheet. I'm not quite sure what that actually is. Is that what that um, polymeric name you said? Polyether imide. Okay, yeah, PMI, PEI. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes I record mail bags on a on a live stream, just to give you a behind the scenes thing. Yeah. But polyether I'm not sure what that is. Whether it's just a high temperature plastic, whether it's a thermo set, I really got no idea. I'm not familiar with it at all. Um. I mean, yes, I work in the plastics industry, that's my job, but um, I only have a relatively small exposure to different kinds of plastics. I mean, some of these things are, you know, engineering plastics are quite specialised, and that's not what I do, so. Yeah. You've got a two-order transformer which has a thermal fuse blown on the primary. Um, you might be able to expose the fuse and replace it. I mean, I actually did a... I've done this a couple of times, actually. And I've got a video recorded of me doing one, and I've got some more to do, actually. What another one? 
which is unwrapping the transformer, the actual um, does the tape around the outside, because often the thermal fuse is on the outside. And you can just wrap, take the tape off and then find a fuse and cut it out and replace it with a new one. You can do it. So, fake versus real quick. Yes, that's right. We did talk about that, didn't we? I didn't get a fake one. We did discuss this. Yeah, I mean, if you have to replace a transformer if you can't fix it, then you might as well just try unwinding it, even if you need to. And to see if you can find a fuse. Might be a field of bump on the outside, even. I don't know. Yeah. Yes, I did make promise to make a video, and I completely forgot. Imagine that. Um, I do remember I was talking about it, and looking at doing a comparison between a fake one and a real one. Um, I will have to make a note of that again. Or well, make a note of it. Fake. Writing it down. Um, quick. This is real quick. Okay, I made a note, okay? So, I will have to get out of Banggood and try and get one, maybe. If Banggood's got any fake ones on there, I don't know, actually. If it's from AliExpress, I have to buy it, and that's not something I'm keen to do, but if it's from a review kind of perspective, I can get one for free. That's absolutely an option. If it is something cheap, like 50 bucks or something, maybe I'd, I'd buy one, but if it's hundreds of dollars, I don't tend to, because I'd rather spend that money on a bit of test gear, rather than a, a, a one-off video review thing, you know? Um... It's covered by the secretary. Cannot see an external indication of fuse location. Yeah, it's a shame. Well, wind noise. You might be here clicking. Wait, air blowing. I do have a window open, but there's no breeze coming through really, and my NAS is just behind the computer screen. You probably hear that clicking. I don't know about wind noise though. Favourite measurement instrument I most love? Measurement instrument I most love. That's, I mean, if the instrument's got its own practical aspects, so. You know, it's not like one thing. You kind of sort of think about, oh, you know, what's the best for that particular task? I think the things I like the most is the older gear. Like over here, I've got my Datron 1082. All right, that's probably one of my favourite meters. I like the design. I like the construction. I like the ease of repair. So, I like it for those aspects. I mean, you can easily say, you know, things like the Siglant STM3065X multimeter, right? Because it can do so much. It's a very powerful instrument. And it, it didn't do far more than that Datron can. But the Datron, I think, is probably just more of a favourite because of, I don't know, it's just the ton of era I like, I suppose. Um, you know, you've got oscilloscopes as well. I mean, oh, I really like my new STS 2000 X Plus scope, right? So, um, that's a favorite out of the ones I've got. Um, because that also can do so much and it's very flexible. Four channels, so it means you've got a lot more measurement capability there. Also, you can get smaller four channel scopes, 
but because it's all a touch screen and a mini system and you can use a mouse on it and that sort of stuff and keyboard it makes it a bit easier to use if you go to that route um, but then obviously the cost is up there um, old oscilloscopes I'm not so keen on like I mean I've got old scopes I've got an old Tetronix 300 megahertz scope but I mean they were cutting edge in the day and they were great in the day but compare that what that can do now to what's available it's just yeah it's okay if you're a hobbyist and you're starting out and you need a scope then something like that is absolutely fine right um, but you can compare that to what these signal scopes can do with like the analog the digital decoding and and um, serial decoding and that sort of stuff you know, it just doesn't compare um, I know it's, I, I kind of like the older gear you know Um, solid state drives well my NAS has got 8 terabyte drives in it so um, yeah 8 terabyte SSDs no that's why it's traditional hard drives Um, to ask you a question, instead of buying a spectrum analyzer, why not buy a VSA like the Agilent E4406A? 7 megahertz to 4 gigahertz. Are they cheap? I don't know. I don't know. I got no idea what their prices would be work, working like. Um, I mean, you can get some reasonable spectrum analyzers for used ones. Like fifteen hundred bucks, you know, like a old HP kind of thing, and that'd be fine. And I've got a eight five nine zero A, I think it was. That does one and a half gigahertz. Um, I've got my CMU two hundred there, which does, I think, up to two point four gigahertz. Was it? I can't remember now. It's up to it's up to two gigahertz something anyway. Um, Although that's a vector special analyzer, it's not quite the same thing, but you can use it that way. Um, yeah, special analyzer are very expensive. Like, I don't know, you've also got things like the Siglant range, right? So they've got their Siglant SSA range. They're looking really nice. I'm actually really tempted by those, to be honest because um, it's like oscilloscopes kind of size and you can do so much you've got tracking generator stuff like built into them and they're much more compact I don't know about this Agilent one you mentioned um, I, I'm not that familiar with it um, I haven't really looked at that kind of gear but um, starting at 1k are they um, let me go have a quick look at that model number. Just educate myself a little bit on this. Once it loads. Well, that particular one is listed as being obsolete. Hey, GB, how's it going? And it's been replaced with the N9020B or 9010B. Yeah. <laughs> um, I would have to look at these things really in a bit more detail. Yeah, I don't know. It's it's a pretty big box. That looks as big as a CMU two hundred. Let's go to eBay and have a look. Uh, 
Hmm. Okay. Yes, prices aren't bad, are they? For used gear, they're not bad. Um, I'd have to research these some more, though. Prices are varying quite wildly, but it's like there's parts units everywhere and things like that. So, parts units might be an idea if it's something I want to do a project on. Depending on the research I can do as far as preparing them, I also need things like service manuals, and if it's got a circuit diagram for it. I, mean, I don't know enough about this particular device yet, but it looks like it'll do the business, but um, yeah, I don't know enough about them at all yet. Uh, half the price signal, yeah. The fact it's got a three and a half inch floppy drive on it says about the age, though, doesn't it? Um, but for the pricing, they're not looking too bad, you know, for used market, you know, something which is older equipment. I mean, the signals they do offer higher bandwidth stuff. They do do stuff like three and a half gigahertz and higher. I do have them available in SSAs. Catches on the back. Well, it's, I'm seeing blanking plugs on the front. Um, let's have a look at another one now. Each unit's fully tested. Comes with a nice sixty-day warranty. Nice. And that price is for me. It's about a thousand dollars to get one plus import duties and stuff like that. You know. Um, I'm just having a quick read. No, I'm doing so much. I mean, that's Agilent branded, obviously. So, not overly old. This one here does have an RF input on the front, 50 ohm RF input. But. External trigger, oh, can't see all the buttons. It's just about input stuff here. Oh, my window's too small, I can't see anything. Right. INQ inputs potentially if there's an option. Rear panel inputs, trigger input, HPRB, LAN. It's got LAN, which is good. External reference in and out, trigger one and two out. So it doesn't appear to be a tracking generator on this one. So that's the thing you would potentially wouldn't have is a tracking gen. Which is handy if you want to do filter work. So that you know something you have to consider if you want a tracking generator or not. Because it looks like this isn't possible on that particular device. Oh there you go, you said no tracking gen yourself. Uh, Signal 1500, yeah. Realize now checking the year. Well, I mean, for hobbyist stuff, I'm sort of thinking, well, you kind of want to be. I don't know. As cheap as possible. <laughs> I can't really put a dollar figure on it. You certainly wouldn't be paying brand new prices if a hobbyist, unless you're really committed to something. You know, if someone's got a bit of money to play with, then they would buy new stuff, I expect. But you know, for hobbyists, I sort of think you know, two or three hundred bucks mark. You know, it's in reach. It must be. But what I would have thought if you want to save up for it and that sort of stuff. I don't know. It depends on how committed you are and how desperate you want the gear. If you want to save up for it or not, and that's. 
you know, we've all been there, all grown from tinkering with things and gradually getting better and better stuff. And yeah. I think it's probably a bit, a bit much, really. I mean, are hobbyists really going to be wanting a spectrum analyzer? Maybe, maybe not. In that case, you probably get something like the, um, oh, what's it called? This little VNA thing. I've forgotten the name of it now. It's a tiny SA, tiny SA, and you get those little modules. They're like a hundred bucks or something, whatever they are, right? Little, little device. Now it's a bit basic compared to what these things can do, obviously, but for hobbyists, it's probably absolutely fine. Um, yeah, tiny VNA and tiny SA. Yeah, that's right. So those would be hobbyist kind of things, right? So. There's a great entry point, it gives you an understanding about how it works and how to use it a little bit. And then if that doesn't perform well enough, then you could upgrade to something better because it gives you an idea of what you actually need. See, it's got to be an AZ. Okay. Um, I've got the tiny SA. So I've got, I've got one. I keep it in Motherhome when we work at events because I need to check for radio interference. Because it's got an antenna on it, I can just set that up, check for radio noise, and make sure there's no congestion on the channels we're going to be using for the equipment we use. So I can just do a verification to make sure we're not going to have any problems. So I keep it in there. I did show that, I think I did a little video on it as well, testing antennas or something, checking resonant frequencies of antennas. Um, so I did it for that. Is it tiny SA or tiny VNA? I can't which one it is now anyway. But it's not one of those things. And it works okay, it works fine. Um, it's obviously not the same ballpark as these proper spectrum analyzer units, but it'd be fine for hobbyists if you just want to tinker around with things and just get an idea of what's going on. You saw the video, okay, yeah. So, what I'm actually looking for is a DSA. Um, I was actually looking at one. I really want to get one of these. Um, where's my? If I don't mess this up, it would be better. I'm trying to find it now. Safe searches. Where are we? Do I have it saved? No, I don't. I thought I did save it. Oh, that's annoying. Hmm. Um, yeah, dynamic signal analyzer is one of the things I actually want to get. MJ Morton did one uh, a few months ago, and I actually I want to look at one like that. So HP branded DSA, wasn't it? HP DSA. Um, trying to see if I can find one. I thought I had it bookmarked as a, well, saved as a favourite search. I thought I had it on there. But the prices are pretty much up there. And the biggest problem I've got right now is shipping. Because I could buy the unit for a reasonable cost, I suppose, but then the shipping is as much again. Uh, here we go, three five six one A. That's what I'm looking at. Is one of those, but that's what I'd like to get. But yeah. I get it from Israel, but the stuff from Israel tends to be beaten up. It's like, I think it's ex-military or something, I don't know, but it tends to be pretty rough. So I only get it from there if I can not find it anywhere else. Um, here's the guy has got the riser cards on there, the same guy did the one I showed you before. 
but there's lots of DSA options in there. You've got HP's, got a whole bunch of different ones in there, and there's other brands as well. But the um, the three five six one is one I'd like to get my hands on. But the other problem is right now with stuff from the USA, the shipping issues. Um, Nano VNA, is it? Oh, I can't remember what it was. You bought a 3562A a while back. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's right, these low frequency things. This is the audio frequency sort of stuff. But I don't have anything for down there. So, I've got higher frequency stuff, but I don't have anything for down there. I mean, my signal oscilloscope can probably do FFT, that's the thing, and do the FFT side and, and do some stuff around that region. Um, so that's kind of where I'm sort of thinking is some of this because this has been a nice little thing to have, you know. Um, do I have a real use for it? Uh, don't know. Do I? Probably not. But it's just another tool to have on hand. So one day when I do need to do something like that, I've got it. But like I said, the signal might be able to do it um, with the FFT functions. In fact, it probably could, to be honest. So I'm actually looked into this enough yet to sort of go, oh, yeah, I'm going to spend a thousand dollars on one of these bits of gear. Um, yeah. But I've been looking recently, trying to find something to buy on eBay. So I'm been trying to find some broken test gear. And I've been looking and looking and looking. I've spent hours just like browsing around trying to find something which looked like something worth getting. Right? So something potentially fixable reasonable shipping costs and something which I don't already have and that's probably the hardest bit of something I don't already have but um, I, I do want some more projects but yeah problems right now is trying to get stuff low frequency RBW drops yeah I suppose it would actually I haven't actually looked at this particular detail but yeah trying to find something to buy I mean I'm just trying to find stuff else um, I want some more projects. I do have some I can work on. I'm kind of putting it off, which is my Valhalla 2703, which is sitting on the floor behind me here. I mentioned it before on a live stream a while ago. Um, I need to pull that apart and dig into that one, figure out what's going on there. But um, yeah, I need to find some stuff to work on because I'm running out of test gear. I've got I need to do something. So the 3562A is a bit bigger than the 61A. That's significantly bigger actually. Which is another thing for me is size. If I can get something which is a bit smaller, it makes shipping a bit cheaper. I mean, to give you an idea, the 3562A, which I can see on here right now, so eleven hundred dollars New Zealand for the unit, and five hundred fifty dollars New Zealand for the postage. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean that's not uncommon these days. The process price is getting ridiculous. A lot of these things, like four hundred dollars postage, four or five hundred dollars, I've seen a lot worse. Um, I'm just flicking through now so I can find something reasonable. Yeah, here's one here is a three five six six five A. Um five hundred fifty dollars for the unit, four hundred fifty dollars for postage. It's just prohibitive really. I mean I have spent a lot of money on postage before because I really wanted something. Um So that's part of the problem is that if I'm if I it's something I really want, I will pay it. It's just absolutely fine, you know. I'll, I, if that's what it costs to get it, that's what it costs. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's a three five six one hay from Israel. Well, like I said, that's cheaper postage, but the stuff that comes from Israel tends to be quite beaten up, or usually got corrosion and that sort of stuff on it. I have a look at this one. Um, I think I may have already looked at it once. Um, 
Just trying to see what kind of condition it looks like it's in. I mean, I I probably would spend that kind of money on one if the condition looks okay. Last calibrated 2012. Mm. Um, doesn't really matter as long as it kind of works. This one is actually not looking too bad. Apart from the screen being glitchy in one of the photos. Um. Oh, there you go. Big ding on the back corner. I'll show you this. Um, there you go. Back corner, it's been dropped on that corner. Mounted. Who knows what that's done to it. But, um, yeah. I prefer something which isn't physically damaged, because physical damage is harder to deal with. David, I'm based in New Zealand, so the other side of the planet from the UK. Oh, Fred's already answered. Awesome. So yes, part of the problem is why the post is expensive. Stuff is expensive to ship here because I'm miles away from anywhere. Um, yeah, you're in Malta, right? I've got some handles recently. <laughs> I may, I may, I may not. I've got some hammers recently in mailbags. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't look too bad. I mean, yes, it's been dropped on the back corner. It's intact. It wasn't enough to break the foot off completely. It's bent an aluminium panel. I'm actually tempted by it, to be honest. I am actually tempted by it. Let me just read the description and see if it says anything about being broken or not. Um, no warranty returns, as is. Yeah, well, that's fine. That's what it is. Um, basic specs. Nothing about condition. Pass a self test and it's selling as is with no return. Right, it says it's a pass a self test. I'm really tempted to buy this actually. It says last one with one sold. Does that mean these pictures aren't actually of the unit I'll be getting? I hate the way they do that. You might find that the pictures of the other unit, not the one which you end up receiving. Yeah, I'm. Israel stuff tends to be dodgy, it tends to be corroded and badly scratched up and stuff like that. I've had a few things in Israel, but I've, you know, I've purchased them because that's the only place I could find them at the time. And although they've been recoverable, they've not been wonderful. I'm inclined to bloody buy it. If it they say it works. Hmm. Well, it's got a CRT and a CRT lights up, so it's you know it's going just the CRT is working. Is it a need or a want? Well, hi Kevin. Um, it's more of a want.
Yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm debating it. I'm. The price is right. The price for units okay. The shipping price is as good as it gets these days. Well, I always state that um, they must um, pack it very thoroughly with. I specify how much padding to put around it, and that sort of stuff. So, put at least this much padding around it, and that kind of stuff. So, if they haven't at least followed the instructions I've given them, I've got a way of saying, hey, they didn't do a good enough job. Um, yeah. I have seen LCD upgrades for these things. There is an LCD upgrade for these available, but it's not cheap. So if the, LC if the CRT did get broken, then it's not a complete loss. I think it had a output on the back as well, did it? So a picture of the back. I'm thinking it might be saying something else. Oh, maybe it's not. Okay, it must have been something else. I know some instruments that actually have like a VGA port on the back. This one doesn't have one. That could be an interesting project. I mean, if a CRT did get smashed, I could do a project of replacing it, couldn't I, and doing repair on that. So it wouldn't be a, a bad thing. Well, it would be a bad thing, but it wouldn't be a, a total disaster. Get a bunch of glass shards, yeah. I use PayPal, yeah. So there have been some times I've had issues with eBay where eBay haven't honoured a listing. So I've received something. I've disputed it because it's been an issue with it. eBay hasn't stood by their guarantee, despite they say, oh, we've got a money back guarantee. There's been half the times eBay have not honoured that. They opt out, oh no, sorry, it doesn't apply. And that's it. You can't argue it. There's nothing you can do. And that's when I go to PayPal and say, the PayPal, hey, this is the issue. I pay for this. I didn't get that. And eBay, I'm backing it up. And then PayPal refund me instead. So that has been the backup system there, is to use PayPal to cover it. Um, and that's saved me some money a few times where things have gone wrong. Where eBay hasn't stood by it like they should do. And, I ha and um, thankfully, PayPal has been the save you there um, yeah that sounds about right with me David um, successful eBay versus PayPal yeah I'm actually getting really tempted to buy this um, Yeah, I'm going to buy it. Let's do it. We'll see what we get. Um, import duties, 100 bucks US. Um, okay. Um, message to seller. Package this very well. With at least, oh, we're drinking three inches of padding. It's gonna be fairly heavy. Um, three inches slash 75 mil of padding on all sides, on all sides, paying special care. to the corners to protect those I do not want it to arrive damaged which is my standard phrasing gives them some thought that hey it could arrive broken if I don't do this
um, push into the corners and front panel. Um, well stored by put in there. Yeah, items. The postal system isn't always careful. See how the typical phrase I put in there. And items may be be dropped or thrown during transit. <laughs> there we go. So I've given them definition, say so make sure you take care of it. You know, plenty of padding. Special care of the corners and the front panel, and um, the rest of it can probably take a, na a, a whack without being too much of an issue. But the front panel and the corners are the important bits. Um, right, let's add it on. Now it's going to do it. Well, I say three inches of padding. I mean, we'll see. It's usually things like polystyrene is what I'll get or peanuts, you know. Um, equally, I don't know a box which is you know six feet square. <laughs> um, I, I say at least three inches, seventy-five mil. Yeah, mm. yeah okay, I'll change it. I'll, I'll change it to four inches. It is fairly heavy, so let's go four inches, one hundred mil. Let's do that. Let's pay for this. And I need to put some money in my, money in my credit card account. Hold on a second. That's inconvenient. Um, the ones I like are the ones that the is it Pitney Bowes do. They actually have like this bag in there and they they do that expanding foam around it, so it completely locks it in place. Those are really good. I really like those ones. I've got enough money in my PayPal account to cover that, but apparently not. So I have to update my credit card, put some more money on it. Not a big deal. Yeah. Yeah, expanding fan bags. What do I do? Yeah, they, they do really well. Those expanding ones. Um, it just completely envelopes the product, and you know, it locks it in the bag in the box as well, so it doesn't rattle around in there. And it, it does really good protection. It's got good compression as well. You get it a, a squash. It does indent into it. What's good about this device? Um, don't know yet. We'll find out. <laughs> it's a dynamic signal analyzer. A st dynamic signal analyzer. So use it for testing low frequency equipment, um, audio kind of stuff. Um, I know a little about it, not much. So anyway, I purchased one. So that's that. I've been watching one for a while, but the price I've been seeing have been over a thousand dollars. Um so the price is right on this. Oh this is interesting. Ooh, they've got something else cheap too. Low frequency, yeah. So um HP 3708A noise and interference test set. What this does? Yeah, I'll show it up top window. Um, we'll have a look at this together. Oh, what about beer? No, it does. Hmm. 
Just do this one, shall we? Can't let the windows fall off. I'll never do it. I can't see the edge of the window, is because it's all black on black. <laughs> anyway, right. This is pretty cheap. Sixty seven megahertz noise bands. Keep IB and stuff on it. Um, oh, that's made this window narrower. What was that? Aux interferer input. Hmm. Anyone know what this is? Wonder what it does. IF input, IF output. Here we go. I can't see those jacks properly. Can't see what they are. Six hundred ohms is that? A oh, fifty ohms. It's got an output. Power meter. So it's fifty ohm jacks. I wonder what it is. It's pretty cheap. This would be maybe an interesting thing to look at. So it's 100 bucks postage, 170 bucks for the item. So that's 270 bucks, like 300 bucks for that. I have no idea what it is, no idea what it does. <laughs> Let's check it Um, to make your own tea. Sorry, Ray. <laughs> uh, I've got no idea. Okay, well, Kitchler. If you do microwave links in a lamp situation, it might be useful. Alright. NT equals no tracking? I don't know. We'll find out. If it doesn't arrive, I'll dispute it and get my money back. If it does arrive, then great. Um, yeah, I'm not too worried about that. It's the risk you take. Even if it does have tracking, things can go missing. So it's not like a... Overall, yeah, it's going to be safe if you do tracking. Wireless comms test set. Ooh. Look at this one. A few bits and pieces here which are interesting. Hmm. That's pretty cheap. Anyway, I've spent a thousand bucks now, so I don't spend any more. Um, but yeah, this is curious. I might add that to watch this and look at it later on. Tracking is a uh, frequency tracking, not postage. Oh, okay. If you're into the sticker, oh, right. Um, I mean that one there on the front there, NT. Right. Well, a 40 piece of test gear is even better. Right, because buying test gear for me is not just about um, adding test gear to my collection, it's about making videos. So if it's something which says, it's got a fault, like it's right next to the track inhibit thing. 
I mean, if it does have a fault, it gives us something to look at and maybe do a video on. Hmm. I'll, I'll have a close look at this and figure out a bit more what it is and research it a little bit. And if it's reasonable, I might buy one. I might buy it. Um, could be a good video, but it's, again, it's quite a big box, right? So these older HP instruments, they're big. So um, it's the sort of thing I cannot fit on my desk here. <laughs> I've actually got a... What was it 8901 was it HP 8901 I think it is modulation analyzer I think that's what it is I've got it in my other lab there and um, I've just got it set into the side because it's as big as staying on the side let you inject noise of a known spectral density into the IF section of a microwave radio link receiver to establish demand carrier to noise ratio. Oh, right, okay, sounds pretty specialised. I mean, most people want to buy test gear which isn't broken. Because I want to buy test gear which is broken because I want to make videos. I want non. Uh, I want repairable failures, obviously, so I can fix them. You know, even if it takes me a lot of effort to do it, I, st I still want stuff like that. You know about Curious Mark, yep. I watch some of his videos from time to time. Tells me interesting stuff. Yeah, I don't know. Is, it, is this thing something I'm going to use now? It's just like a noise injection thing. Well, New Zealand's a pretty small place. <laughs> and even like even the stuff I've fixed, right? Let's just get rid of this. Um, I'm closing this off now. So even the stuff I've repaired and and put up for sale, it may sit there for a long time. It could sit there for months. I've had stuff sit there for a year before it's sold, because the demand isn't that high for electronic test gear here. There's not that many people doing it. Um, I mean, if I had the prices really really low, then would, I'm sure they'd sell. But I have to at least cover what it costs me in order to buy it, ship it, import duties. And repair parts and stuff like that. So, yeah, it's it's a problem, you know. Um, I wish it was a bit more popular, and I could actually have a, a network of people I could liaise with and do um, collaborations with. Um, but there's not many people here which do it. So at least there are some people around the country. You know, some people on here, for example, right? Um, but nothing local to me really so sheep counters maybe <sighs> oh dear, sheep jokes sheep jokes but you're watching Dave too much at me the EU box got some answering to do yeah So I mean, I I would like to have some kind of collaboration thing with other YouTubers near me, and we could do stuff, you know. Um, like I, the only one I've really done is with Dave, like in person. As I went over and saw Dave at Blog. Some of you know this. Some of you probably saw it. Um, some of you have been talking about this before. Where I went over and saw Dave in Australia and um, dropped in his lab and just hang out there for the day, basically, and. Um, yeah, he pulled apart a calculator and gave him and demoed it and stuff. But yes. But yeah, it's just that's I wouldn't like to do other stuff, but yeah. It would be nice if I could find some other people near me or so it'd be so be practical. I mean, I, I, it doesn't help that I live in the middle of nowhere either. I'm, I live a fair distance away from anything, which adds to it. The Welsh hate sheep jacks too. 
Yeah, I don't know what it is about that. Anyway. Did I finish my coffee? I did. I thought I ordered another one. I'm on North Island. I'm south of Auckland. Day is quite a distance away from me. Yeah, it's not exactly a uh, easy drop in to do things sort of thing, you know. So, um, yeah. Yeah, it's like, oh, what's it? Probably $1,000 in air flights just to go over there, I suppose. Somewhere. Like. Yeah. Anyway, that's another thing here or there. It doesn't really matter that much. But, um, yeah. This is a big, yeah. I mean, I live a fair drive away from anywhere, really. It's in Old Zealand. Well, I did wonder about that because this is called New Zealand. So there must be an Old Zealand or a Zealand. Somewhere, I don't know. There must be. I've got no idea where the name came from. Really, I haven't really thought about it that much. Yeah, I'm not sure what the distances are between from here to Sydney, Sydney, Sydney. Um, it's a couple of hours flight. Was it about a four hour flight? I think it was, and I can't remember. Yeah, it's a while. Not that close. Zealand is a province there. Okay. No, oh, right. Spelt slightly differently. Interesting. That might answer the question. Right, so I'm thinking about giving up the stream because my throat is getting really sore. Too much talking. Um, yeah. Population of 2.3 million. Populous island. Ah, oh, it's from an island, is it? Oh, okay. Right. Well, once I get some projects to work on, we do some more interesting live streams instead of me sitting here just chatting and waffling away and stuff. So I need to get some projects sorted out, and hopefully this thing I'll just purchase um, will feature. How long will it take to get here? I don't know. Um, I'm actually a bit hesitant to buy stuff in the USA right now because I know that the US has got issues with postage trying to get stuff out of the country because there's just no transport so yeah we'll see how we go Dutch province Zealand yeah okay well thanks everyone dropping by don't forget to a thumbs up before you leave and I'll catch you in the next one with that is I don't know when that'll be um, I want to try and get something something to work on so we can do a project and tinker around and do some soldering and stuff and actually fix something hopefully Bit more interesting that way, I me mean, just waffling. So, catch you later. Nice dropping by.